Dear God, we just want to thank you for the country that we were so blessed. To be born into. And God, I pray that you would heal our land. It was founded on your word. And God, I pray that we would go back to your word. The enemy is being ruthless and trying everything he can to rip out our prayer and the word of God out of this nation. And I, God, I pray for our president. I pray you'd save his soul, that you would convict him, and that he would turn to you, God. I pray for all the leaders that they would rise up and that they would take a stand. God, I pray that each one of us would be bold witness for you. You said in your word that the righteous are as bold as lions. God, help us to be bold in this dark time. Fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit to do what you've called us to do. And God, we pray that we would just see at least one more great spiritual awakening and revival before you come back. God, I pray that we would each be a part of that, just doing our part, just to win one more for you, Jesus. God, help us stay on our toes to be ready for your return and do the work that you have to do, that you want us to do as it's still day. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, we're going to be in John chapter 9. And today's message is called, I Can See Clearly Now. I Can See Clearly Now. John chapter 9. And let's just start off by reading verses 1 through 7. So John chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor her, his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which translated sin. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Now, one of the most popular questions that people ask about God is why does God allow evil and suffering in this world today? Why doesn't God stop all evil and suffering that's going on in our world currently? And this is something that people will wrestle with. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 5.45 that he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. We all know that good things and bad things happen to good people and bad people. It's just part of the fallen world that we live in. But I say all that to set you up for Jesus healing a blind man here in John chapter 9, and throughout this study I'm going to answer um, those tough questions from God's word. 
Uh, Jesus notices a man blind from birth as he's leaving the temple. Why was Jesus in the temple? If you remember uh, last week, actually the past three weeks, we've been learning all about the Feast of the Tabernacles. And Jesus was in the temple last week in John chapter 8 during this feast. And he stood up and he preached a message uh, to those who were listening to him in the temple. And one of the things that he said, he said, if any man thirst, if he comes after me, I will satisfy them if they drink from what I have to offer. And then you remember the religious leaders brought a girl that was caught in the act of adultery and they were about to stone her to death. And Jesus protected that woman. He showed her love, showed her grace, and she ended up giving her life to Jesus. Another thing that happened in John chapter 8 is Jesus declared himself to be the light of the world and he claimed that he was God as he said, I am. So the last time we saw Jesus in John chapter 8 verse 59, they were taking up stones about to kill him because he had claimed that he was God. So they knew that what Jesus was claiming to be and, and so they're about to you know, knock Jesus out with some stones. And it says that he passed by them and left the temple and the, the religious leaders wanted to kill him because of his claim to deity. So let's look at verses one through five. Now, as Jesus passed by, he's exiting the temple. He saw a man who was blind from birth and his disciples asked him saying, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So John chapter 9 is a section of scripture that deals with the miracle of sight. And here we see Jesus notices a man who was born blind. And the disciples ask Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now the Jews believed that all physical illness was a direct result of sin in your personal life. And this was a twisted theology. This is, is not good thinking. You know, the Jews believed if you are suffering, there must be some sin that's going on in your life. Does that sound familiar of another story in the Bible? Can anyone give a guess? Job. Job. Awesome. Um, so remember Job's buddies who accused him, Job, man, you are suffering greatly. There's, what secret sin are you hiding from us? Just confess it to God and, you know, and just move on. Stop hiding whatever sin it is that's going on in your life. And we understand that it was not God's judgment upon Job for some sin that he had done. You remember that Satan was afflicting him in order to try and prove to God that Job would fail. But Job stood strong and, you know, he put his faith and trust in God, even though his whole life just unraveled in front of him. Now, we know this belief of suffering is not true. You know, there are plenty of examples of godly people who have suffered horrible things, lots of tragic circumstances, and they were living, you know, righteous, godly lives. You know, we just live in a fallen world. But we do know that sin can result in physical illness. You know, there is consequences to our sin. If we are sinning, there are sins, of course, that can result in being ill physically, like if you get an STD, um, that can actually transfer to the baby, and the baby could actually be born uh, blind. But we also know at the fall of man in Genesis chapter 3 that because of the original sin of man that Adam and Eve committed, death came into the world, and of course that includes all sickness, uh, death, illness, disease, uh, Romans 5.12 tells us 
Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. So in one sense, all illness is based off the original sin, the, the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. But not every sin in our life is because of some personal sin that we have committed. We just live in that fallen world. And the rain falls on the, the just and the unjust sometimes. And unfortunately, unfortunately, there are many today that carry the same ideology as the Jews did. They taught if you're sick, somehow you are in sin, and that is just not always the case. And I've even been told before in my past, I was sick. And someone said, Ryan, you just don't have enough faith. You know, there's got to be something wrong that's going on in your life. But that, that's not always, you know, the, the case. But Jesus answered and said, neither this man or his parent sin. So the question is, why is this man blind? Why was he born blind? Why does God allow us to get sick? Why does God allow illness to come into our lives? And I believe God allows things to come into our lives so that we would be forced to turn to him, to rely on him. Because you know, when things are going smooth in our lives, when the job is going well, the bills are paid, your car starts in the morning, we tend to forget God, don't we? Everything's uh, easy when things are smooth. You know, we tend to get our mind off the Lord when thing, everything is running smooth. Sometimes God allows afflictions to come into our lives to get our attention and also to keep us humble. Remember what happened to Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The Bible said that he received a thorn in his flesh some kind of physical infirmity. And what was the purpose of that physical illness that Paul got? It was to keep Paul humble. And remember, Paul prayed three times, God, please heal me of this infirmity, three times. And God said, Paul, no, I'm not gonna do that. But God did say in 2 Corinthians 12, nine, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And nobody likes to suffer. Does anyone here like to suffer and go through pain and tragedy? No, I, I do not like going through pain and tragedy. I don't like to suffer. But do you think that God can use it to bring something good out of it in each one of our lives? I, I can think of a few things how suffering can be used by God as a benefit. Uh, first of all, suffering can equip us. You say, equip us for what, Ryan? Well, ministering to others who are suffering with something that you've suffered with in your past. You know how you get that degree or the credential to minister to people who are suffering is by going through what they are suffering. And so you must join that club to be able to speak to people who are suffering. And if you've never suffered in your life or had a problem, what are you going to say to people who are suffering or going through great pain or tragedy? And that's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 1, 3-4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So, you know, God works in us and comforts us and helps us get through our tragedies and our suffering and our pain. So once we get through the other side, he's probably going to bring somebody else that is going through that same thing that you went through. And you can give them hope saying, hey, Jesus brought me through this and he's going to bring you through this and he's going to help you just like he helped me. And you're going to be able to say, hey, this verse is the verse that I clung to during this tragedy. And I pray that it will cling to you, too. And so. Number two, suffering, pain and tra tragedy strengthens us. Uh, James 1, 2 through 3, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking no nothing. So now, now most of us 
don't really do that. We don't count it all joy when we don't get what we want or when we get into trials or tribulations or pain. You know, oftentimes we'll complain, you know, uh, but we don't count it. Yes, God, uh, thank you. Praise the Lord. This is happening, this horrible tragedy that's going on. You know, God is going to do something wonderful in my life because of this pain. You know, that's not our first response uh, most of the time. And currently, I um, have gone into a trial at my work, and I most likely will lose my job because I don't feel comfortable getting the, the vaccine. And I have a pretty nice job at Micron, and they're mandating this. And I know that God is going to work this out for good, but I, I don't feel comfortable getting it. And I know that if I walk away from this job, that God is going to be faithful, that he's going to provide for me and my family. You know, but, you know, in, in the construction world, it, it's, a, it's a tough, you know, walk. And, you know, I got a pretty good job at Micron. They gave me a laptop and an iPad and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, I'm going to stand for what I believe is right. And... And it, it's, it gets scary sometimes. And the more Egypt oppressed the children of Israel, what happened? The stronger that they got. Uh, Exodus 1.12 says, The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And what's crazy is Egypt... They were in dread of the children of Israel because of how powerful and bold and courageous they were. Even the more and more they oppressed them, the stronger they got. Uh, Romans 5, 3 through 4 says, We also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. So when we go through trials or tribulations and sufferings, those things will strengthen us. And number three is suffering also corrects us. You know, when my son Harley is not acting like Jesus, I will correct him. And, you know, the first thing that I'll do is I'll confront him and I'll say, talk to him. I'll say, Harley, hey, what you're doing isn't nice. This isn't what, you know, Jesus would want us to act and behave. And if he still you know, is being a stinker, you know, I'll put him in a timeout and I'll sit him on my lap and I'll count to 20 and I'll talk to him about it some more. And then if he's still disobeying me, you know, then I'll give him a spanking. And, you know, but that pain inflicted works to mold him into the man God wants him to be because of discipline. Uh, David said in Psalm 119.71, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. Um, I'm going to show you a quote that, it's up on the screen, but this is a powerful quote by C.S. Lewis. He said, Pain plants the flag of truth in the fortress of a rebel soul. I thought that was just a pretty sweet quote. But the point is, pain corrects us. And God uses pain to get our attention and to correct our steps and to put us on the right path. Romans 8.28 says, you know, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. All right, so look at verse 4. Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. So you've got a day to work, Jesus says. And the metaphor of the day is a lifetime. So you don't know how long that's going to be. I don't know how long my life is going to last. I don't know how long your life is going to to be, but at some point the sun is going to set. We're all going to die. And life will be over on this side of eternity, which means all the opportunities we had to do good will be over. 
You know, you won't be doing good works to help people or to comfort people in heaven, to counsel them or to evangelize to people in heaven. Because the only people in heaven are the people who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And they're in a perfect environment, completely renewed, restored, and life is good. And so we're not going to be, you know, passing out tracts in heaven or, you know, trying to win people to Christ because everyone in heaven will be already one to Christ. You know, we're not going to be praying for the sick in heaven because there won't be any sick people in heaven. There's not going to be any more illness. There's not going to be any more death. So all the opportunities we have to work for God happen right here during the day, during our lifetime. The night is coming when no one can work. So Jesus is urgent about this. And it's pretty amazing how when you look at Bible prophecy and what's happening in the world today, the stage is set for Jesus Christ to come back at any day. Like he can come back any moment. When that last person gives their life to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, he's going to rapture his church. And it's crazy how the birth pains are intensifying. There, and there's so many warning signs, I believe, that God is giving us that his return is very near. And so Jesus, I believe, is getting our attention and he's telling the church, wake up. Be bold witnesses of me. Preach the gospel because we don't have much time to lose. And he's preparing us for his return. Let's look at verses 6 through 7. When Jesus had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. And this story, I believe, echoes the story in Genesis when God formed man. What did God form man out of? The dust. And, um, and, you know, we're just dust and water. And so here Jesus spits on the ground. Jesus is the creator. And now the creator is recreating sight for this man. And so he spat and then he put the mud from his saliva on this man's eyes. And I have never seen those, you know, who do healing ministries ever try this, but I don't think their healing ministries would last that long if, you know, they had a crowd and they started spitting in the ground and putting mud in people's eyes. Um, but it would take a lot of saliva to be able to make mud to smear it on, you know, two eyes. And so I'm sure the disciples are looking at Jesus like, Jesus, what are you doing? Like, you're crazy, you know? Um, and this is a very interesting procedure Jesus uses to heal this man. And this is an incredible miracle to be sure. But the procedure for his blindness is what intrigued me. Because Jesus spit on the ground, made a little mud, rubbed it on this guy's eyes, and told him to go and wash. And this man started to be able to see clearly. Now the reason I think it's interesting is because in Matthew chapter 9... Jesus healed two other blind men, but how did he do it? He just touched their eyes, and they were healed. In Mark chapter 8, he also healed a blind man. And how did Jesus do this one? He actually spit into the guy's eyes, but you know he didn't see it coming because he was blind, so it probably <laughs> didn't bother him as much. But... <laughs> And he was healed, you know, just like a viper, just spitting. And, um, but here he makes clay out of the ground, spits on the ground and rubs it on, totally different. So the point is the procedures for these, diff these healings are very different. You might ask, well, right, why, Ryan? Why is Jesus spitting in someone's eyes, spitting in the mud, and then just touching them? Why are there all these different procedures here? Why wouldn't God do it one way every time for everyone? I think God likes to mix things up because he knows us very well. He knows that we would try to package this and sell it. And you 
he would end up, you know, we would end up looking to the procedure rather than prayer to him. You know, if, if we found out if you just spit in somebody's eye, we'd just be going around spitting. You know, we wouldn't be talking to God, say, God, how, how can, you know, what do you want us to do? We would look at the method rather than the maker. And therefore, I think God mixes things up. It keeps us, you know, on our toes. It keeps us connected to him, and it keeps us constantly turning to him and trusting in him. All right, let's read verses 8 through 16. Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not this he who sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. He said, I am he. Therefore, they said to him, How were your eyes opened? He answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received sight. Then they said to him, Where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought him, who formerly was blind, to the Pharisees. Now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Therefore some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So it was Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened this man's eyes. And you know, Jesus does this a lot on Sabbath. I don't know if you've picked this up now. Um, it's kind of like he looks at his watch and says, all right, boys, it's Sabbath. It's time to do some healings and some ministry. We're going to ruffle some feathers, guys. And he says, you know, it, it's Sabbath. I'm going to do something here. And I say that because seven times there are seven miracles that Jesus does on Sabbath. And he always stirred up the religious leaders and ruffled their feathers. And Jesus did it to ruffle the feathers of those who wrongly interpreted what the Sabbath was all about. In the Jewish writings called the Mishnah, these were man-made uh, book on what it meant to keep the Sabbath. And so they made all these man-made rules and regulations on what you could and couldn't do on the Sabbath. And pretty much every single one of them you can't find in the Word of God. And so one of their rules and regulations is it was forbidden in the Mishnah to heal on the Sabbath because you're considered working on the Sabbath. So it was forbidden also if you broke your arm on the Sabbath, your dad couldn't set your arm back in place. You would have to wait till the next day to set your arm back in place. Another rule was if your spit hit the ground and made a little furrow in the ground, a little you know, pocket, you know, that could germinate a seed and, and say, you know, you're farming on the Sabbath because your spit hit the ground. So they had all these crazy rules and regulations. And Jesus just heals a blind man and they're giving him a hard time about this. Now, what kind of people don't rejoice when a blind man is healed, even if it's on the Sabbath? It's people who prefer policies over people. The policy is more important to the religious leaders than the actual suffering of the people. And what's crazy is the policies didn't line up with God's word. And I'll tell you this, when policies don't align with God's word, it is okay to disobey those policies. And we see this all throughout uh, the Bible, I think, of Pharaoh commanded all the midwives to what? Execute all the firstborn sons. What did those midwives do? They disobeyed Pharaoh's command, and they hit those boys. 
You think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They refused to bow down to King Nebuchadnezzar's command. Uh, Peter and John, they were arrested for teaching Jesus. And they were locked up. And before they got out, they said, you guys better not share Jesus anymore. You guys zip it, no more. And they said, we can't stop, we won't stop sharing the goodness of God. And they went out boldly. And Peter said in Acts 5.29, he said, we ought to obey God rather than man. So let's look at verses 17 through 25. They said to the blind man again, What do you say about him because he opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son? who you say was born blind. How then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age, ask him. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So they again called the man who was blind and said to him, Give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. But one thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. Uh, John Newton got the words for his song, The Amazing Grace, from this uh, verse. Uh, John Newton was a slave traitor and he ended up getting converted into Christianity and he wrote this song amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see and here's what I love I don't know all the stuff you're asking me the blind man said to these religious leaders but there's one thing I do know. I was blind, and I met this man named Jesus. And now, I can see. Like, that is amazing. And you can't take anyone's personal testimony of what God's done in their life, because it's their living proof of what God can do to a person. And that's why our testimonies are so powerful and that's why we need to be sharing you know who we were before Jesus but most importantly how we met Jesus and how Jesus transformed us after meeting him it's important for us to tell people how you came to Christ you know this is my story this is what God did for me this is who I was before I came to Jesus and this is who I am now you know, people can't argue with your God story because it happened to you. And, and you are living proof. And, you know, they pulled this man's parents to verify. And they said, yeah, our, our son was born blind. He can see now. And when people look at your life, I you know a lot of people say, I know who Ryan Scheibel was. You know, I, I had a nickname, Crazy Scheibel. And people are blown away by what God has done and it's by his grace and his love and his forgiveness and so let's look at verses 26 through 34 then they said to him what did he do to you how did he open your eyes he answered them i told you already and you did not listen why do you want to hear it again do you also want to become his disciples? <laughs> so he's evangelizing already. Then they reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. 
We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we don't know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, Why this is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from, yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered and said to him, You were completely born in sins, and you are teaching us? And they cast him out. Now, this is like one of the clearest and most logical, compelling arguments that I've ever heard. He says, for a brand new convert, he says, there is no record of anybody historically who has ever been born blind and healed. And it's true, in the Old Testament, there is not a single record of all the miracles in the Old Testament. There is not one recorded instance of a blind person from birth who was able to see again later on. And so this blind man was spot on. He says, but now I see. You know, what are you going to do with that? Like, this guy has to be God. He has to be from heaven because who else can do that? Only God alone can do a miracle like that. And you know, when you lose an argument, a person will often result to a personal attack, right? And so after this blind man points to Jesus as God and that he was the one that healed and that he's from heaven, the religious leaders start a personal attack on this blind man. And they say, you know what? You were born of sin. They kind of like diss him. And that's why you were blind all of your life. They're, you know, you and your parents are horrible people, they pretty much say. Now look what it says at the end of verse 34. What do they do? What do they do to this blind man? They cast him out of the temple. They unsynagogued him. And now he's cast out. He's kicked out of the fellowship of Judaism. Let's look at verses 35 through 38. Let's see what Jesus does with that. Jesus heard that they cast him out. And when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you right now. Verse 38. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped Jesus. Don't you love that? They disowned this blind man. They rejected him. But who goes and finds him? Jesus. Goes right next to him. Jesus finds him and accepts him. And Jesus said to him, You have seen the Lord with your new eyes. You are seeing God in flesh with your brand new eyes. I'm the Messiah and I'm with you. And I love you. And, and he said, this blind man, or previously blind man, he said, Lord, I believe. I believe that you are God, that you are the Messiah, you're my Savior. And he worshiped Jesus. This man acknowledged Jesus as the Messiah, his Lord and Savior. And this man was cast out of the temple, but the Lord of the temple finds him and brings him close to He's rejected by society of men, but accepted by the Son of God. So you've got this beautiful contrast. And when we don't go with, you know, the Bible says don't be conformed to this world. And when we don't conform to this world, what happens? They're going to kick us out. 
they're going to persecute us and do say names about us and all this kind of stuff. But God sees what's going on and he loves us. He wants a relationship with us. Uh, the, the Bible says that he's close to the brokenhearted and he helps those who are crushed in spirit. And maybe you've been rejected on earth in some way. You're suffering or you've been cast out by men, maybe by a boss or a legal system. You know, some of us feel cast out, rejected, despised, sad and hurting, sorrowful, alone. But one thing we must never forget is Jesus loves us and he is with us wherever we go. Um, And he's going to help us with whatever situation we might face. So let's read the rest of this chapter, verses 39 through 41. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would then have no sin. But now you say, We see. Therefore, your sin remains. So some of the Pharisees heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? And yes, the Pharisees were very blind. Uh, What did Jesus call them in Matthew chapter 23? He called them blind guides. He, He called the religious leaders, you are blind leaders leading the blind. And he spoke about them being in darkness, not knowing God, opposed to the truth of God. And that's what, you know, spiritual darkness is. And I will say, I believe the story of the Bible can be summed up in pretty much four words, uh, from darkness to light, from darkness to light. It starts in Genesis chapter one, darkness was over the face of the deep. And what did God say? Let there be light. And there was light and God saw that the light was good. And if you turn to the last chapter in our Bibles, Revelation chapter 22, it says, when we'll be in heaven with Jesus, that night will be what? No more in 22 verse five. And they will need no light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. And so there's gonna be no more darkness of sin when we get to heaven. And we see the darkness of death and sin creeping in all around us today. And we see it through Genesis to Revelation. We see this, you know, battle of just darkness and, you know, God bringing the light. We see this darkness in our lives, but we constantly see Jesus in the Bible and in our lives breaking through the darkness and bringing light into situations. And I call this like a sunburst. If you're ever looking at a very dark, cloudy day, don't you love it when all of a sudden, boom, you know, the light just explodes through the sky and you might have been cold and then all of a sudden you get warm, you know, you get those goosebumps. You know, I love that. And it's just such a cool picture of Jesus coming in this dark world and, you know, being the light in this dark and hurting world. Jesus comes and brings light and hope to this dark world. And that is the gospel. That is the good news of Jesus. And that is why Jesus said in verse 5 of John chapter 9, what did Jesus say? He said, I am the light of the world. And so we need to understand the metaphor of Jesus as the light of the world. And there are uh, three things like light that God is like. It's a tongue twister. So God isn't the physical sun, but in many ways, God is like the sun. So the physical sun in the sky, the ball of fire you see, uh, gives us three things. The the physical sun uh, gives us life, it gives us vision, and it gives us joy. So if you look If you took the sun away from us, every single one of us would die. 
if the sun stopped being on fire, we just, you know, we would die. We'd freeze to death. Life would not be possible because plants would die, crops would die, which means we wouldn't be able to get oxygen and we wouldn't be able to get food. And so we need Jesus like people on earth need the sun. From Jesus, we get eternal life. You know, without him, we will die spiritually. We'll be separated from him for all of eternity in a place called hell. Because the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And our sin separates him. Um, Our sin separates us from God. But God wasn't okay with us going to hell. And so that's why he came into this dark world. He saw this world headed to hell. So he came on a rescue mission to save us, to make a way for us to get to heaven, to be forgiven of our sins. And so the only way that we can get to heaven is by accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and believing on the finished work of the cross and that he rose again three days later. Jesus said in John 10.10, I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Now the Son not only gives us life, like Jesus gives us eternal life, but the Son also gives us vision. We need the Son to have vision. You know, we can't have vision or sight without the Son. Uh, Without light, you can't see color. You know, when the lights are out, you might be able to see shades of blackness, but when the lights go on, you can see color. And we were all spiritually blind without Jesus, and we couldn't see things as they truly are. And Jesus came to open our eyes to help us see his love and purpose for our lives. Just like he gave sight to this blind man, Without Jesus, we can't see or understand things the correct way because we were blinded before Jesus. And and he gave us a sight to see things the way that he sees things. So when you follow Jesus and you get into his word, you see things in the right perspective through the lenses of scripture and begin to see things how God sees Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And finally, the sun gives us joy. I don't know if you knew this, but people in the north and um, south of the earth, they have a lack of sun there. During the winter, they have complete days of darkness. And they struggle with depression because of this. And I, I spent three months in Alaska And the family that I was staying with, they had this special light in their house and they would have to get near it during the winter because they would have to get the vitamin D from the special light that it would give off so they wouldn't, it would keep their um, happiness and joy up and so they wouldn't get so depressed during the winter. But people struggle with depression because of lower levels of sunlight. And we get vitamin D from the sunlight which makes us happy. So not only does the sun make us happy, But Jesus gives us true happiness and joy. And we can rejoice in the Lord and have no and have joy no matter what difficulties we're going through because God has done so much for us. And no matter what we're going through in this life, even if we pass away, we know our names are written in heaven. We know that we're going to be with Jesus for all eternity. And I just want to close um, with a story of a blind girl. And I want to try to explain heaven to you through the story. And so there was this girl that was blind. She was born blind. And this is a a true story, but she went to the, the doctors and the doctor said, you know what, I believe that I could do surgery on your daughter and I can give her sight again. And so they went through, and their parents, I mean, anything, you'll do anything for your kids, you know, as a parent. And they were trying so hard to, to have their daughter see again. That, that was like what they wanted for her daughter. And, you know, the mom and the dad would try to explain to her how beautiful this world was. And, you know, try to explain to her colors. But how do, can you explain colors if you can't see? And so they go and they do this surgery, and the doctor was really confident about it. And they pull out the bandages for the first surgery and it didn't work. And so the doctor told the parents, all right, I think I know the issue. 
if you can, let's let her heal up. Let's try another time. I, I believe I can really get your daughter to see again. And so they went in for a second surgery and it failed. It didn't work. And the doctor begged the parents, give me one more shot, just one more shot. So they do the surgery and they pull off the bandage and the girl gets up. She walks to the window and she told her mom, mom, why didn't you tell me it was so beautiful outside? And there was kids playing out on the playground and her mom said, honey, I tried my best to explain to you how awesome color and sight is, but I just don't have the words to share it with you, you know, how amazing it is. And I can't explain how amazing heaven's going to be, but it's going to be like that. We're going to be blown away. You know, Paul said that he heard and saw things that he couldn't even put in our human language. It was remarkable. And, you know, that's where we're headed when we pass from this life to the next. And it, it's going to be glorious. And if you've never made a decision for Jesus today, or, you know, if you're watching online live, today's the day. You don't know when we're going to take our last breath. And Jesus is the only one that can get us to heaven. He's the only one that can forgive us of our sins. And ultimately, we're all going to be healed once we get to heaven. He's going to take out all illness, sickness, and death. We're going to have new bodies made for heaven. And so if you want to make that decision today to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm just going to close with a prayer. And I just ask that you would just uh, follow along and repeat this prayer after me. So with all heads bowed and eyes closed. So dear God, we just want to thank you so much for this time in your word. God, we thank you for recording all these amazing stories for us. And God, we want to be bold witnesses for you, just like this blind man. And God, I pray today, if there's anyone here or watching online or watching this video later on, and you're tugging on their heart to accept you as their Lord and Savior, they know they're walking in darkness, and they've never turned from that darkness and let the light that you offer come into their lives and save them. God, I pray that they would make a decision for you today. And so if you want to give your life to Jesus for the first time, or if you want to rededicate your life to the Lord and say, today, I want to follow Jesus, just to repeat this prayer after me. So dear God, I'm a sinner. I've been living in darkness. I see how you're the light of the world. You've come to save me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins and rising again three days later. Today I'm going to make a decision to follow you as my Lord and Savior. God, fill me with, with the power of your Holy Spirit. Help me to walk this new life with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.